We're in Luke, so uh, please turn to Luke chapter 14. <laughs> We're going to uh, read and study uh, together this morning uh, from the 14th chapter and verses 15 through uh, 24. We're in a section in the gospel in which Jesus is uh, addressing kingdom truth. Uh, the Jewish people uh, may generally uh, be said to have been hoping and looking for a Messiah to come who would uh, put an end to the centuries-long subjugation of, their, of the people of Israel uh, to foreign powers, in this case, uh, Rome. And uh, so he, Jesus has been addressing that from several different perspectives, describing uh, variously what the kingdom is to be like, uh, who will be included and who excluded, and also what will characterize its citizens. And the Lord had already revealed uh, in the last chapter, chapter 13, beginning at verse 28, that some people uh, who expected to be welcomed into the kingdom will instead be excluded. And consequently, you remember, there will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And our passage today will reveal that those excluded have only themselves to blame. In the immediately preceding verses, which we read last time, it's been about three weeks now, the Lord emphasized humility and compassion as commendable virtues, concluding in verse 14, that such persons will be repaid for those virtues. He says, at the resurrection of the righteous, that is when the kingdom does come and everything is put right. And now in our verses today, he'll describe the kingdom as uh, uh, Warren said at the beginning in terms of a great man's banquet to which he gracious, graciously invites his guests and of the urgent importance of responding to the invitation once it is given, for there will be no excuses allowed. And so let's read the passage again, beginning in verse 15. Jesus has just said, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. And I got an exclamation mark after mine in my text. You probably do too. But Jesus said to him, and he proceeds to give a parable. A man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. So an attentive reader will notice there were actually two invitations in our first couple of verses there. He gave a big dinner and he invited many. And when the time came, he sent his slave to those who had been invited and gave them this second invitation, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. Uh, the first one, have you ever heard people make excuses? <laughs> the first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master, and then the head of the household became angry and said to his uh, slave, go out at once into this, this sense of urgency, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Now I want you to notice if you glance back over to verse 13 in our last lesson, uh, those are the people that, the same people that Jesus had suggested uh, the important people of the Jews should be inviting to their dinners, uh, not the important people, not those who could uh, 
uh, returned the favor, so to speak, but it was uh, the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Back to verse 22, and the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. So we have an intriguing parable from the Lord uh, describing a master of what had to have been a large estate hosting a great uh, banquet and inviting many. There's a similar parable, if not exactly parallel, in Matthew chapter 22, in which a king is uh, described who gave a wedding feast for his son. It, it follows a similar course. He sends out invitations to the celebration, uh, but his chosen guests uh, are unwilling to come, and then he expands the invitation list with varying results, but up until the time the wedding hall was finally filled with dinner guests. And the underlying message of them both, I think, is quite alike when the king uh, graciously invites you to a banquet, it's imperative that you come. It's imperative that you come. Uh, both parables point us to a real banquet, uh, not a uh, imaginary one indicated by Luke about uh, with this transition from Jesus' words at the end of verse 14 about the resurrection of the righteous to the seemingly pious exclamation of the unnamed guest in verse 15, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This man is excited. And I say seemingly uh, because the parable that follows concerns superficial assent to the prospect of enjoying the fellowship of the king. It's as if this man was filled with the gravity of the moment and couldn't help but burst out with his amen to that when the reality would later reveal the emptiness of his feigned desire for such a kingdom. Our nation is uh, filled with men and women like that. The Western world is, but I think our nation uh, leads the way in superficial affiliation with Christ and the church, uh, whose connection to the gospel and to Jesus is the kind of shallow, wafer-thin relationship we might rightly characterize as a dalliance. It's a subject for them that only comes up superficially in conversations as a kind of social identity in reinforcing one's general acceptability among peers. I'm used to that, being in a public workplace. Many of you are too. Everybody's a Christian there. Uh, so the conversations go something like this. What'd you do this week? And well, after church, you know, we went to brunch and then we played pickleball. <laughs> or our church had a bazaar to raise funds for the homeless. I served as chairwoman this year. <laughs> I'm talking about the type of faith that's not really faith at all, but a mask people wear in order to project respectability. To some degree, that kind of dalliance is changing uh, as our society becomes more and more uh, materialistic and amoral. The urge to soften our reputation with religion has tended to fade. Uh, surveys show the number of people today who identify themselves as none on these surveys, surveys has increased significantly year after year over the past generation. And that's one of those good news, uh, bad news uh, kind of developments in which the bad news uh, we come to realize is actually the good news uh, because the decline 
of empty identity with Christ and Christianity actually has a clarifying effect in distinguishing between persons with true faith in Christ and those who merely mouth the jargon of faith. This parable concerns itself uh, with that. It's about dalliances with Jesus Christ. Uh, just as God had made himself known through the marble of the creation all about us, so he has extended in wonderful grace to many a special invitation to know and believe in the gospel. But so many greet it with indifference or spurn it altogether. The parable begins in verse 16. A man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. Uh, this is a parable. And so what is important is not a story about an important man hosting a special uh, banquet or as in the Matthew account, a king inviting guests to his son's wedding feast. In the New Testament, and again, Warren alluded to this at the beginning, uh, a great supper or, or banquet stands for the celebration that salvation brings when the saved are united with Christ at the culmination of his kingdom. It's pictured vividly and wonderfully in Revelation chapter 19 where Christ's bride, the church, has been made ready and the heavenly voice uh, commands John uh, to write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's significant, I think, that the Bible often pictures heaven or as the case actually is, salvation, as a lavish, celebratory meal. I like to eat, and I like to eat with family and friends. And so it's a beautiful picture that appeals to me. I bet it does to you also. But it points to deep satisfaction in the company of people that we enjoy and of the remarkable privilege in receiving an invitation from such an honored and revered host. Kent Hughes described it as a lavish, sumptuous image of the kingdom of heaven that will be exceeded by its reality, joyous satisfaction. Here in the, in the parable, we should interpret this as an invitation to many to come to that celebration and be included in the joy. But we won't really understand what transpires in the parable unless we understand the custom of invitations at this time, in which a formal invitation uh, was really of two parts. The first part of the invitation was in the form of an announcement that the banquet was planned and a response was required. And then the second, more urgent invitation was sent when all the arrangements were prepared and the time had arrived. And we can see this in several places. I'm just going to mention two. Uh, there's the banquet that Esther held, remember, to entrap uh, Haman, the enemy of the Jews. It happened in two phases. And if you're taking notes, it's, you can see it in Esther 5, verse 8, and then Esther 6, verse 14. A later a remark in the Midrash of the Book of Lamentations, the rabbinic commentary on the books of the Bible, uh, shows that this custom had continued. It reads, it's about Lamentations 4, verse 2, but it, the Midrash reads, none of the men of Jerusalem would attend a banquet unless he was invited twice. It was something of an upper-class courtesy. That's my phrase that I've attached to it. It was an upper-class courtesy. Uh, the king, or the rich man, uh, he had many servants and uh, there was a great amount of preparation to tend to uh, with animals to be slaughtered, the, the fatted pig, uh, and, and, the, and, and in, in a day and time when foods would spoil if not partaken of in a timely manner. So when the banquet preparations uh, were finally complete, the host would send out messengers to those who had been invited to inform them that the feast was ready 
and they were to come. Now's the time, come. It was the decisive moment that they had all agreed to uh, at the beginning. Yes, we will come to the feast. And this is the meaning of our 17th verse. At the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. Some of Jesus' parables can be a bit difficult to interpret. There's one in here that I'm sort of fearful of, but anyway, we'll get to it when it comes. Uh, this one is fairly easy, right? Uh, it's obvious that the master of the house, or in uh, Matthew's case, the king, is God, and he is graciously and patiently inviting a multitude of people from every ethnic and cultural identity to come to the special banquet he has been preparing over time and which is now prepared and ready. It was prepared and ready, just to fast forward a bit, in the person of his son who uh, came to earth uh, for us. In Matthew, he sends servants out to bring in the guests. Here, only a single slave. Uh, that may be a veiled reference, this single slave to the Holy Spirit, who is tasked with issuing a general call to people to come to the feast, and therefore to come to salvation. And it may also extend from that to the prophets of old and to the apostles and even uh, to the gospel witness of the church uh, throughout the ages. But the parable goes on in verses 18 through 20 to detail the decisions those invited made when the moment actually arrived. Though, though they are urgently beckoned by this messenger slave, they all find excuses not to attend the banquet. And not surprisingly, they sound very familiar uh, to us, uh, for they reflect both the scripture's witness to the blindness and dullness of men to the gospel call and our own experience of living in the midst of a nation filled with people like this to whom the invitation has been extended, uh, but for all the manifold reasons find themselves unable to accept it. They're flimsy excuses. And they all go back on their original promises, which of course reveal they were empty promises in the first place. It was because they had bound themselves to other obligations that trumped the offer made by the host of the banquet. And that's the sense of the phrase we see in the first excuse in verse 18. I need to go. Simple word, I need to go. That means something like, I'm obliged, I am bound. We all have obligations, uh, things we're obliged uh, to, both legitimate and illegitimate. It's a matter of priorities. Here we see three, uh, which in the minds of the invited guests superseded their response to the kindness of the host. One is about a field, that is some real estate, another five yoke of oxen, and a third has gone and taken a wife. <laughs> Ken Hughes la labeled the excuses the century one excuse. Real estate, the century one excuse, the bovine excuse, and the nuptial excuse, very clever. But none of them were legitimate. Uh, first, the man who had bought the piece of land, I'm in the real estate business, and uh, one of the primary activities I'm involved in, in is arranging the purchase of parcels of land uh, in a, a standard contract. <clears throat> we have a little thing called the inspection period, not very different from when you're buying a home, you have an inspection period, and it gives you a limited amount of time to do your due diligence on what you're buying, the real estate that you're buying, before your earnest money goes firm and you're required to actually close on the, the property. It's highly unlikely this man in the parable had not already 
uh, gone out to look at his land before he bought it. He did his due diligence, and therefore his excuse was something like a lie. The truth is, he had decided he didn't want to accept the invitation to the Great Supper. He didn't want to. The second man objected, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going out to try them out. And that's about 20,000 uh, pounds of beef stock. And he would have the Lord of the feast believe that he had not inspected the animals before committing uh, to buy them. Now we got a couple of, we have a couple of cattlemen in our assembly. Uh, unfortunately, both of them have kind of moved further away, but the big cattle sale is the highlight of their year. But they'll tell you no one buys any cattle without having already verified their quality. The truth is, <clears throat> this man too had decided he didn't want to accept the invitation to the great feast. And then the third one, curtly answered, I have married a wife, so I cannot come. His excuse had perhaps an air of legitimacy. Uh, there was a provision in the law. Uh, you've read it in Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, for exempting a newlywed man from military service in order to give the young couple a year to enjoy uh, their m marriage before the husband marched off uh, to war. But attending a feast is not quite the same thing as going through SEAL training. Uh, his wife would probably have enjoyed a night out with her new husband, like my wife still does. <laughs> the reality was the newlywed man didn't want to accept the invitation to the banquet. He didn't want to. Verse 18 um, says that they all alike uh, began to make excuses. Each may have had their different excuse, but they all had gotten occupied with something that was more important to them than following through on their commitment to respond to the invitation. Of course, the parable is not really concerned with the invitation to an earthly banquet. It was the invitation to respond to the call of the kingdom of God that was the Lord's purpose in telling the story. And the excuses were the same kind of excuses people make today, and they fall into the same uh, categories. Uh, fields equal uh, investments, money, so we got money. Uh, oxen, that's our occupation. Some people have put uh, their occupation on the top shelf of their life. It's the most important thing in the world to them. Um, marriage, our affections, a good thing, but even affections within the family uh, can get out of whack. Now those were all legitimate pursuits in and of themselves. What was lacking was the vision of what awaited them at the banquet. They had set their sights too low they had not been gripped by the wonders that awaited them. Uh, the possessions and affections of the world around them were the obstacles to their acceptance of the pleasures of the kingdom. This is what Jesus offers, a feast of peace, fulfillment, <clears throat> the end of fear and doubt, the erasure of the curses of sin, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. That's 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, and we could paraphrase it for our own purposes. All that God has prepared for those who accept his invitation to the great marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Jesus said in another place, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. They, all alike in our parable, had their heart in the wrong atmosphere. Spurgeon told the story of a rich ship owner who uh, was paid a visit by a godly man and the Christian asked him, uh, well, sir, what is the state of your soul? To which the merchant replied, soul? I have no time to take care of my soul. I have enough to do just taking care of my ships. But he was not too busy to die, Spurgeon warned, which he did about a week later. The invitation is urgent. Now I think about, we were watching golf yesterday and this young man uh, withdrew from the Colonial Golf Tournament in the in the middle of his second round and he's dead today. Now I read he made his decision before he died but that's how urgent it is. We never we can never know. It's understandable that people often respond as if it's not urgent. They know not the day uh, that it will render their opportunity void but no one thing when that day comes, it will be too late. So behold, now is the acceptable time, says the scriptures. Behold, now is the day of, of salvation. But for these uh, three who were invited first, uh, other things kept them from coming to the supper when it was ready for them. <clears throat> the slave came back and reported this to his master in verse 21, and Jesus says that he became angry. He became angry. I don't know if you've ever committed uh, the faux pas, really worse than a faux pas, that Cindy and I did uh, one weekend several years ago. We'd been, we had been invited to the wedding of the daughter of some friends and we were really looking forward to it. Uh, number one, we were honored that we'd been invited to the wedding. Uh, number two, we knew it would be a super wedding with a very nice um, reception following. But then the appointed day uh, came, the appointed Saturday came, and we were both sidetracked. We were absorbed in a, a family issue. I, I couldn't even tell you uh, today what it was, but it was commanding our total uh, attention. And so the Saturday passed. I might have been teaching the next day. Sunday passed too, and then on Monday uh, at the gym, I remember uh, my friend, a friend asking me, where were you and Cindy Saturday night? And that's when it hit me. We forgot. We had totally forgotten. That's, I don't think that's ever happened to me, but it did. And I asked him how the big event was, and he told me it was great. <laughs> and they had a sit-down dinner like they do in the East, not so much here, but they had a sit-down dinner, and Kirk told me, there it was, right next to us, seated next to us, Mark, Newman, Cindy, Newman. So there was no hiding. So I waited an appropriate number of days before I called the dad, the father, to apologize. Now you've already noticed, I hope, that we had our excuse. <laughs> And I was front and center with our excuse. Poor us. Uh, don't you see how it might have happened that though, though we told you we were coming, 
uh, when the day actually arrived, well, we had other things going on in the, you know, and the response was cordial but cool. You could just tell what he thought of our excuse. And the reality is, if I am honest, there is no other way to look at it. The wedding of his daughter, as it turned out, was not important enough for us that we remembered. Other things uh, crowded it out. In our parable, uh, the slave's master became angry, not just cool. And Jesus continues the parable by describing how he then instructed his slave to widen uh, the invitation list. Uh, first, uh, what we might call uh, outcasts, uh, but then even the strangers who lived outside the city. We must remind ourselves of the uh, setting. He was ensconced in this leading uh, Pharisee's home, having just reprimanded them for their conduct and for their attitude when one of those Pharisees uh, spouted a, a pious, uh, self-serving trope, hiding his self-righteous heart. Now Jesus has begun telling a story of a great man who invited many of what should have been his obvious guests to a great banquet, but they had universally, uniformly rejected his kind invitation, and the Pharisees knew he was talking about them. Uh, the elite of Jerusalem and of the nation. They also knew he was describing the resurrection of the righteous in God's kingdom from which they were excluded in the parable because they had not accepted the invitation Jesus had extended to them to embrace him as the promised king. It gets worse from there, for in the story, the man directs his slave now to uh, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. This is the second part of the parable. Uh, his invitation rejected by the privilege, the master was insistent that the big dinner be held as planned and that the hall be filled with guests. He was passionate about that, so he sent his servant to the poorer quarters of the city to bring them into his home to enjoy the feast. The servant obeyed, and many of the poor, crippled, blind, and lame came. But there's still room for more. So in verse 23, the master directs his slave to widen the circle still, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel, compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. So he's now outside the city figuratively, uh, which means he's been directed to bring in what can only be described as complete strangers to the society that forms the background of the parable. These are Gentiles, obviously which mirrors what indeed actually did happen with the gospel message and its invitation to first the Jewish leaders along with the Jewish people as a whole, but eventually after they refused the invitation to come to salvation in Christ, the gospel was proclaimed to the Gentiles and that's recorded in our book of Acts and in, in the epistles of the New Testament. Uh, the apostle Paul may well have been, I mean this, in Jesus' mind when he spoke these words in verse 23, for he would become the apostle to the Gentiles. And that became evident in explicit form later when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey in uh, Acts chapter 13, and they came to Pisidian Antioch. Uh, they had been making it their practice, you remember, when they went into the different cities, they would go into the synagogue first to offer the gospel message to uh, the Jewish population, and they had done that there too in Pisidian Antioch, but finally after the Jews repeatedly over and over again rejected their message, and I'm quoting now from Acts 13, they spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. 
it was an at least partial fulfillment of our parable. Uh, the slave was instructed uh, to go outside the typical conclave of the Jews into regions inhabited more by Gentiles. Our text says that he was to compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. That word compel, I want you to look at it, it's an interesting word. Uh, some of you have uh, make them, uh, make them come in. But the word means basically to invite, but in actual usage, it varies between a kind of, you know, offer you can't refuse kind of uh, invitation, and hence this translation, compel, compel them to come in, and a softer version, a softer translated translation version, meaning to invite urgently or to strongly urge and that must be its sense here. One of the commentators, Walter Liefeld, suggested the translation, insistent hospitality. Oh, I won't take no for an answer. You may know that this verse has been used, uh, taking that first harder meaning to justify the use of force in Christianizing uh, peoples and nations. It was used in the Inquisition uh, to justify enforcing or forcing peoples to uh, adopt Catholicism, often in brutal ways. But that is not the meaning here, and the reason is that is not how God works. It's not the way God works. So that can't be the meaning. This passage and this parable, above everything, emphasize the critical importance of responding to the gospel invitation once it has been extended. There's no entrance into the messianic feast apart from responding to the invitation. A mere dalliance with an idea will not do. One must obey the gracious call to come to Christ. Just look at our passage. I, I, I would like for you to now and, and notice how often the command to come uh, occurs in verse 17 come for everything is ready now verse 20 I cannot come but now in verse 23 compel them to come now where else do we see that word come used so often it's in John chapter 6 in the three verses there that we cite so often in our meetings you can turn to it if you like but most of you know them by heart, John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And then finally, verse 65, for this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father, unless it's been given to him, a gift. If there's one thing that is clear from these verses, it is that the command to come to the king's banquet in our parable, which is the equivalent of coming to faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sins and for the entrance into heaven and the promise of eternal life in his kingdom is solely dependent upon God's gracious enablement to obey his command. No one can come unless the Father draws him. No one can come unless it has been granted him from the Father. And all that the Father has given to the Son will come to him. The Son will make that person eternally secure. Doesn't that make you feel great? So when the master in the parable uh, tells his slave to compel the chosen peoples to come in so that his house may be filled, that's a reference, listen, to the work of the Holy Spirit for whom compelling is his great expertise. <laughs> that sounds too casual, but he's really good at it. It's called irresistible grace, and it stands for the Spirit's gentle persuasion 
of God's kingdom people to come to him in faith. The Spirit doesn't do it by force. He does it by changing our sinful disposition so that we're willing to come. As Dr. Johnson used to say, he jiggles our willer so that we're able to put aside flimsy excuses and our love affair with the world and come to him in faith in Jesus Christ. Our parable gives us a glorious picture of our loving God. He desires his house be filled. That's how he's pictured throughout the Bible. I could give you several examples, but remember Isaiah 65, 2 pictures the Lord saying, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. Uh, Jesus, uh, his son in Luke chapter 19 will say the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Our sovereign God cannot be defeated. The work of his son in is the work of forming a people for himself. We're his inheritance. We're his in, in, inheritance. God's inheritance will not be taken from him. He will not lose one iota of it. And all who come to him will enter into his kingdom. And those who don't, as we close, well, the sad result of their rejection is found in the final verse. Uh, none of those men who were invited but spurned him will taste of the dinner of the king. You may resist God's purpose over and over again, but you cannot overthrow it. So if you're listening, I know all of you, <laughs> but if someone is listening and perhaps you have adopted a dalliance with Jesus Christ or with Christianity, Heed his gracious call and come to him in the obedience of faith. And you will enjoy the sumptuous banquet of the king, the marriage supper of the lamb. Praise the Lord for that. Lord, thank you for that promise. Thank you for the certainty of it. Thank you that you have... Uh, come and persuaded us uh, uh, irresistibly uh, to drop our excuses, drop our uh, obsession with the world and cling to you alone to enjoy at the end uh, life eternal and the sumptuous banquet of being in the presence of your son. Bless those who are struggling now with that decision. Uh, Lord, go send your Holy Spirit to compel them to come. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.